All right, so welcome. My name is John Lakos. I work at Bloomberg and have done so since 2001. And uh, this presentation actually was made faster than any other presentation I've ever made before because I took a 975 slide deck and paired it down to 384 slides, rearranged it, and I'm gonna present half of those slides today. The good news is, is that they are the same slides that have existed before, and we're talking about something that's new, modules. And we wanna make sure that whatever new thing we come up with uh, works on stuff we've been doing forever and know is important. So this is not an exercise in new syntax, but it's actually an exercise in something that will work for engineers for real projects of scale. That's the idea. So what we're gonna do for the first part of the talk is talk about things that we would wanna do if we didn't exactly have modules, but we had something called components. And then in the last part, we're gonna talk about what the requirements would be for modules if we had them. Now, a little bit of progress has been made since I gave this talk last in ACCU in that uh, um, Richard Smith has produced some uh, headway in, in bringing together what the module TS and, um, uh, uh, and, and, what, and, and Google's way of thinking about things is. And there's a lot of overlap. I'm gonna say that I'm skeptical, and I'm putting it mildly, that we're in a position right now where we can say any common subset is cast in stone because the ink isn't even dry. But what I am gonna tell you is this stuff is more than 10 years old, and yet it's perfectly good and works wonderfully, and this is what we're gonna to continue to do, and if we can incorporate modules, we will, but if we can't, we won't, we'll be perfectly happy not to. But we would like to because there are many advantages that modules could bring to the table, if done properly. So with that said, I'll start out, this is the copyright notice which I'm supposed to put in here, so there you go, copyright notice. This is the abstract, and I'm putting it in here. Uh, well, you know, you're here, so you're gonna see what it is regardless, but I'll put it up here for the folks at home. Uh, what's the problem? Well, large-scale C++ software design has multi-dimensions, and I've learned this a lot since the first book came out in 1996, and I made a promise to everybody that there would be a a next volume this year, so I'm kind of stuck and have to do that. So I'm saying it again on video. By the end of this year, there will be a printed copy of large-scale C++ process and architecture. So I'm saying it here. If it doesn't happen, um, either I died or something worse happened, but hopefully that will in fact happen. It involves many subtle uh, logical and physical aspects, and physical design is one of the things that I talk about more and in this particular case, uh, this is really at the heart of what we're talking about here is physical design. So this talk is particularly relevant to what the first book was about. Then there's also the ability to isolate functionality in discrete fine grain physical modules, which we call components. And then it requires the designer to delineate uh, logical behavior in English precisely while managing the physical dependencies on other subordinate modules. Notice it says components. The word should be almost interchangeable because if I have a component and I want to replace it with a module, that should work. If I can't do that, I failed with modules. That's the idea. And as I said, I wrote this many, many years ago, these slides, and they have to still work because I can't afford to rework all of my slides when we have modules. Okay. The C++ language itself lacks a mechanism to characterize and render software at a sufficiently high level of logical and physical abstraction. So what we have right now are translation units and .h.cpp pairs. And they do a good job, but they don't do as good a job as they could. And so modules should be an attempt to do better. And I'll explain in what ways they can do better, and I'll also explain what ways they won't do better, no matter how much we want them to, they just won't. Sorry, truth hurts. All right, so we're gonna review the basics of component-based de design. And there are properties uh, with logical uh, diagrams and, and such, implied dependency, the two most important physical design rules, uh, guidelines for collocating classes, logical encapsulation, when to use includes, our three-level package hierarchy, unfortunately, that's not really gonna be here because that's in part two of the talk that we're not gonna get to. Uh, introduce the notion of new C++ language entities, uh, a new C++ language entity called a module, 
and describe it in terms of the essential engineering requirements it must fulfill if it is to be readily adopted widely in industry. And I'm talking about large companies. If you're a small shop and you're already working in C++ 14 or 17, you can just go in and do some stuff and it'll be fine. But if you keep in mind that there are companies that have been out there for 20 or 30 years, they have huge client bases, they have open source code, it is not reasonable to say, well, we'll just run a script. That's not gonna happen, just not gonna happen. So we have to be very careful about how we introduce modules into our large code bases. So here's our outline. We're gonna cover the first two in this talk. Someday I hope to give you, give you part three and four, but if we could just get to parts one and two, we'd be almost done because the last part talks about a module as a higher level architectural unit for designing things that are bigger than a component, i.e. at package level, but we're not gonna get there today. But the idea is if we just cover the first part where a module is a substitute for a component, we'll be doing great. And that's all we can hope for in the near term because the next thing is the next thing. And what's nice is if we design properly and carefully, we won't preclude it in our current design. So that's one of the things I'm very uh, concerned about, that we don't do anything in our current adoption of modules that would preclude the goodness that could come from thinking it through and getting it right. All right. So review of elementary physical design. So this is my age-old style. It goes back to before the turn of the century. And we have physical and logical entities. And the physical things uh, are in square entities and the, the logical things are in round entities. Logical classes and functions, physical files and libraries. Um, if you look at it, we can stack up components like Lego blocks and each block internally has different logical content, but macroscopically they all look the same physically. And that's kind of what we want for modules, right? Modules are container for logical content. So here's a component. Component has an implementation an interface, and a standalone test driver in my world. Module would be no different. This is the fundamental unit of physical design today. A module would be the fundamental physical uh, unit of physical design when it comes to be. So here we have a component is not just a .h.cpp pair, nor is a module. So there are four properties, and I've said this many times, but no reason not to say it again. The .cpp file includes its .h file as the first substantive line of code. Okay, why do we do that? Does anybody wanna say why we include the .h as the first substantive line of code? Is there a reason for that? Yes, sir. We always know that the files download. Oh, what I heard is that the .h file will always compile standalone, and that is correct. The reason we include it first is for that reason. The reason we include it at all is so that our code in the CPP file will compile because much of the code is not self-declaring. Very good. It also allows for neighborhoods. And we should all know that Lisa would be proud to know that we always include the header file in our uh, implementation file. We also always include the header file at our client site so we can get that shared understanding across translation units. Right? right. There we go. All right, even if the CPP file is empty, we still include it in the CPP file because we wanna know at that component point that it compiles. We don't wanna wait for our client to say, hey, wait a minute, that didn't compile. All right, all logical constructs having external linkage defined in a .cpp file declared, uh, uh, are declared in the corresponding .h file. Now, there are a bunch of things here that we talk about and everybody knows what they are except some people don't. So I'm gonna start with the difference between the uh, declaration and a definition. So what's the difference between a declaration and a definition? What's a declaration? It's imparts type information. It imparts type information. Okay. It's the type of the name. It's the type of the name. No, it associates the type of the name. It associates the type of the name. That's a vote. What, 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 is it, what does it do for the compiler? Why does the compiler wanna see a declaration? How about it introduces a name into a scope? Would you go with that one? And at the same time, maybe a type. Maybe. All right. So we've got defined and declared. What about defined? What is definitions? What do they do for you that's different from a declaration? It gives the thing. The declaration says there is something somewhere, and the definition makes the thing. Okay, so the definition makes the thing. 
Uh, all right, well, it provides additional information uh, about, let's say, storage or something, something extra besides just the name. And sometimes we, we need that in order to use it, and sometimes we don't, right? So anyway, let's, let's talk about this. Int A, is it a declaration or a definition or both? both. I heard both. Okay, good. Sometimes, you know, when I did this at ACCU, people were very timid about answering that question. How about this one? Declaration or definition or both? Declaration. Declaration. And this one? Okay. Void F, open, close, semi. Excellent. Void F, open, close, open, curly, close. I don't need this, do I? That's a bug. I gotta read my slides. Class foo. Class foo, open curly brace. Well, there's more coming. It's a declaration and a definition. How about this one? Yes. What is it? Okay, it's a declaration only. What about that? All definitions are declarations. Why is it? <laughs> What's that? What's that? What's that? You're saying it's a declaration and a definition in what version of C++? Yeah, it's a standard. This is a declaration and a definition? Okay, you can't have that code. This code cannot exist unless you've seen this. Really? All right. So I'm going to have to have another term, but this is not a self declaring definition. Yeah. It is not the initial declaration of that name. It cannot be there. I think this is, this is like, we'll, we'll talk about this, but I want you to understand that for the purposes of this talk, this is not self declaring. It has to have already seen a declaration. So I'm going to say that this is a definition only, knowing full well that the standard has another idea. Do we all understand the difference between this special thing and everything else here that was either a declaration only or a declaration and a definition? This is special. This needs another declaration. So I'm going to call that a definition only, even though I'm wrong, according to Chandler. Then I'm going to go investigate. <laughs> all right. It's the first time I heard that. Swear to God. Um, all right. All, log all logical contracts, have uh, contracts having external linkage defined in the .cpp file are declared in the corresponding .h file. So we now know what a declaration and a definition is, and then I want to explain what linkage is, and I'm going to try to get this one right. So what linkage means, uh, if you have external linkage, it means that the thing that has external linkage can be referred to from separate translation units. In other words, I can have a declaration of it in one translation unit, a declaration of it in another translation unit, and those two declarations refer to the same external linkage entity. Am I right, Chandler? External linkage. Can refer to the same thing from different... Okay, good. Okay, glad I got that right. And uh, so now what does this mean? This is saying that if an object can be referred to outside of the translation unit in which it's being defined, the CPP file, then it must be declared in the .h file, in the corresponding .h file. And the reason for this is we want to make it very clear that if something's going to leak out at the ABI level, we want a human being to know about it. Doesn't matter whether it's public or private, but it has to be there. Okay? Now, um, this, is the, this is one side of the equation. The other side of the equation, well, well, so we'll do this. So int a, that has external linkage, okay? What about this? What kind of linkage? Internal. Internal. What about this? Okay, what about this? This? 
Okay, so that changed early, early on in C++. No, just right there. Right there, namespace scope. So the point is, is that inline functions have another property, right? They have some interesting physical properties, but logically from that, from the point, that point of view, they have this property, they have external linkage. Static inline void f, what about that? <clears throat> Class foo. See, linkage and bindage, which we're about to learn, are different things. It has external linkage. If I say class foo in one translation unit, I say class foo in another translation unit, they mean the same class foo according to the standard. How about that? Internal or external linkage? Great. What about that one? Internal or external linkage? Okay. What about this? Yes, good. So at least we know what I mean when I say declaration, definition, or both. And we at least all agree on internal versus external linkage. But you just said that wasn't a declaration. How did you link about it? Right. Separate issues. What I mean by it isn't a declaration, because Chandler has corrected me, it isn't a self-declaring <coughs> definition. It's a definition that needs to be declared separately. So when I say definition only, meh, little shady there. What I really mean to say is it can't declare itself. That's really what I mean. Okay. There are two different kinds of definitions, those that are self-declaring and those that aren't. When I say definition only, I mean one of those definitions that isn't self-declaring. Okay? Thank you for the clarification. So now having said that, this is the definition for that declaration. All right, so what does this mean again? This is saying that if I have something that has external linkage in my CPP file, then it must be declared in my .h file. That's a rule, that's a requirement of a component. If that's not true, we have a bug in our definition of our component. So, what's that? What's the linkage there? Namespace, open curly brace, class foo. Why class foo even in the Lamas namespace actually have external linkage? So, as of, correct me if I'm wrong, as of now, this has internal linkage. Yes? I, I think you are wrong. It's external linkage, but, for, but in a fairly physical and silly. Okay, so what, what, what it was in C03 is that it was external linkage. But, but it, it was external linkage in C++03, but you couldn't use it because the name was so obscure that only the compiler knew how to find it. So it was effectively internal linkage. My understanding now is as of C++11 that it is internal linkage, the same as static. Is that right, Chandler? Chandler, give me the thumbs up. It's internal linkage now. Okay, static, okay, so this one, internal or external? This one? This one? This one? Did I leave out my closing namespace thing? I think I have a bug here because this should have a brace. Yeah, oops, I, oops. I didn't spell it right either. Oh, these slides were pretty quick. All right, I got to work on that. All right. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so two things. I'm, I'm missing. I should have really read these slides. So anyway, so no, this, no, this, this closes this. This is okay. This is misspelled, and I'm dyslexic too. Uh, this has external linkage, right? And this one? Okay. And this one? Okay. And this? And this, okay, so it's, it's, it's an error in one of two ways. It doesn't compile, and it's either, it's either a multiple definition, right, or, or if you take this one out, 
But anyway, this doesn't compile. There are two different reasons why it wouldn't compile depending on how you sort of bind it. But anyway. So I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to give you an idea of what's going. That's a declaration. That's a definition. That's a declaration. That's a definition. That's also a definition. Okay. Hmm. Huh. All right, the next rule is all constructs having external or dual bindage declared in a .h file, if defined at all, are defined within the component. Now, what do I mean by bindage? So we have linkage, which is a term that we can talk about in the standard, and then we have bindage, which is a term I invented because I can do things like that. And bindage means how we connect the use of a symbol with its definition. So. There are two ways to bind things in, in our world. We can bind it with a compiler, or we can bind it with the linker. Those are the two ways. And some things are bound always by the compiler, and some things are bound always by the linker, and some things can be bound either by the compiler or by the linker. So can somebody think of an example of something that is bound always by the compiler? A local variable. How about a type name? Or a type def, I'm using a type def, something like that. Does the linker ever get involved with a type def? Does the linker ever see the name of a class in the sense that, you know, I say class foo, and I want to associate that with the definition of a class, so I've got class foo, open curly brace. Where does all that stuff get resolved? That's all compiler stuff. In other words, when the compiler gets involved and the linker never sees it, there's nothing put down in the .o file, then that is bound by the compiler. and We say that has internal bindage because the compiler takes care of it. Then we have stuff that's bound by the linker and we're talking about external linkage functions. So if I have a function or a, 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 a global uh, variable of some sort, that's gonna be handled by the linker. And then there are two constructs in C++ that have dual bindage. So we have internal bindage, compiler, external bindage, linker, and then we have something called dual bindage. And there are two constructs in C++ that have dual bindage. Can anybody tell me one of them? Are you talking about like static function names? No, static function names are, are internal linkage. And they're handled, they, they're their own thing because a compiler could, could inline a static thing. We'll leave, that, we'll leave that to one side. I'm talking about external linkage functions. So what has dual bindage? What could be handled? That's an interesting point, by the way. I will give you this. The compiler or the linker within a translation unit could bind a, a static function if it saw the definition, it could do that. Let's leave that out for a second because that muddies the waters a little more than I wanted to. So fair, fair enough, a static, static method inside a translation unit could be bound by the compiler within that, that area. But I'm talking about across component boundaries. Inline functions is one, what's the other one? Templates. templates, excellent. So inline functions and templates have this interesting property where the definitions live in the header file. And so the client compiler might decide to inline them, whether or not the template function is declared inline, it might decide to do that. And if it doesn't decide to do that, then it puts, or, or maybe anyway, puts down stuff and, uh, uh, in the .o file where the linker can see it and then do something with it. Does that make sense? So that's, that's, yes. I'm sorry? Oh, because of the, the, yeah, all right, yeah, that, I don't even want to go there. Makes me uncomfortable. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, I just want to let you know. That's, that's sort of going the other direction from where I'd want to see it, but, all right. So the comment was the inline variables. <sighs> Breathe. All right, so all constructs that have external uh, or dual bindage, meaning that the linker could get involved, if the linker could get involved, then we want to make sure that if they're defined at all, that they're declared in the header, if they're defined at all, they're defined within that translation unit. This is a, a sort of a, a long-winded way of saying, if the compiler isn't going to see what you're doing in order, you know, the definition, in order to use it, then you better not declare it locally. You better import the header file so that you get that kind of checking with the neighborhoods and all that good stuff. Otherwise, you have brittle code. Now this is important. Whenever you have something that the linker is gonna get involved with, it's not guaranteed that your compiler is ever gonna see the definition and be able to do that neighborhood check. And so 
if it has either external or dual bindage, which means the linker could be involved, then you must import the header. If it's internal bindage, then maybe, then maybe you don't need to import the header. Having said that, all right. In other words, a forward class declaration is not the end of the world, but everything else is. If you were to forward declare a function signature, no good. And more and more we're seeing that forward class declarations aren't worth it because they could turn into specializations of templates and then trying to, to, to do the continuous uh, uh, refactoring and improvement becomes more and more painful, especially if you don't have a single code base and access to Clang and somebody who knows how to use it. Then you can, okay. So anyway, and fourth, okay, if you're gonna access components functionality at all, you do, do so through an import statement as opposed to uh, a forward declaration. And it's not really a forward declaration, it's really a local declaration. Forward is misleading because if it's a forward declaration, then you'll see it later in the same translation unit. So this notion of forward is probably obsolete. It should be local declaration. Uh, okay, so moving along. These are logical relationships, and I put this up here for intuition. Um, a shape is an abstract interface, a polygon is a kind of shape, polygon uses point in its interface, polygon is implemented in terms of a point list. So I'm just gonna say, is a, polygon is a shape, public inheritance. Uh, uses in the interface, a function uses a type in its interface, if it names that type in its interface, uh, uh, or, or as part of its return type, okay? A class uses a type in its interface, if it has a member function that uses that type in its interface. So polygon uses point in its interface because we have something called uh, insert vertex or something like that. Okay, or even something as simple as what is your origin? So get origin. Now point list and point list link, the way we deal with it because this is ancient stuff and we don't, this was before we even had standard C++ and nested classes that could be forward declared and it works and it's also sort of a more general theme that we like things at the same uh, level to be at the same level and not nested. The nesting causes more confusion than it's worth. So we use this underscore to indicate that the point list link is private to the module, I mean component. We wouldn't need to do that in a module because we'd have other ways of doing that, but here we do it by convention. So we have a private or component local class and we just know not to use it outside the component, but of course, if we had language support, it would be better. And both these things use point in their interface. Then we have this next thing called uses in the implementation, and a polygon uses a point list in the implementation because it has a point list data member. So we have that, and also a point list uses point list link in its implementation because it has, holds a chain of links doesn't really matter because it's within the same translation unit, so it doesn't leak out, it doesn't cause any additional dependencies, it's all good. Then we have this uses in name only, which is a very funny thing, because it doesn't create any physical dependencies. In fact, you don't need to pound include, you can forward declare. So it turns out that shape uses point in name only because shape is a pure abstract interface. Not even the .c not .cpp file includes uh, point.h, just forward declaration. And strangely enough, shape has something called get origin, and get origin returns a point by value. And still, shape doesn't know what a point is because it's an abstract interface. So this is interesting news for some people, but it's a fact. Um, all right, so uh, implied dependency. From this diagram, we know that inheritance is a very strong logical relationship and implies a physical dependency between the translation units or components or eventually modules uh, that, that, that hold them. Then we have users in the interface. So Polygon uses point in the interface, so it's going to depend on that physically. So there's gonna be a pound include involved, it's gonna import it and so on. The same is true for point list and point list link. They both use point in the interface, so they both are going to import it or include it. Notice the similarity, it's really the same thing. And then finally, Polygon uses point list in the implementation, and it needs to know substantively what's going on, and so we have this situation here. Make sense? Okay, next thing in good old basic physical design, we've got this notion of level numbers. So what are level numbers? Well, if you've got something in a local 
region of your program and it doesn't depend on anything else locally, we say it's at level one. What does that mean? The path from it to itself, right, is the, the distance, right, is, is, or I should say, well, it indicates that it doesn't depend on anything else and the level number is an indication of the, the depth of the path to the lowest level thing. So this is at level one. Now shape, strangely enough, shape also doesn't depend on anything else substantively, even though it has this uh, uh, logical relationship. It's, it's more of a, uh, of a uh, uh, nominal nature. It's not of a physical nature. So it's also at level one. So these are co-conspirators, but there isn't an actual physical dependency. There's no include. Now, that's not the case with pointless. Pointless really does depend on point. And so it's at level two, because there's an include. Uh, point list imports point. And then we see polygon because it depends on things at level one and also things at level two. It can't be at level two, so it's at level three. So this is pretty much self-explanatory and this has been around forever and pretty much you know this. And once you have something like this, you know that you can test everything at level one independently. Then you can test everything at level two independently. You can test everything at level three independently. And you're always testing something in terms of other things that have already been tested. This is a good thing. You can also reuse things independently. So if I've got something at level two, I never have to depend on anything else at level two or higher. I can use that thing by itself. Now I might need some level one things, not necessarily all of them but I can use that subsystem without pulling in the rest of the world. This is a really good thing, but we know that. All right, so there are two essential physical design rules. What might they be? Does anybody know what the two most important physical design rules are? No cyclic dependencies. No cyclic dependencies. Somebody knows me. What's the other one? No uplink. I, what's, I don't know what an uplink is. Is that a cyclic dependency? Uplink. Yeah, okay, what else? No long distance friendships. What is a long distance friendship? It's friendship that, that, that is talking about something outside of our translation unit, outside of our module, outside of our component. If I say something outside can be a friend of mine, I have just created a hole, an open-ended hole in encapsulation, not good. We don't do this. Okay, so you really have to change your design style. If you have friends that are just whatever, no good anymore. They have to be captured within a module. This has been around forever, and modules should do the same thing. There should be a notion of module private. Okay, when would we ever put, not private classes, but public classes, publicly accessible classes in the same module? Any ideas? Okay, a strong probability is not good enough. We'll talk about that. Cohesive, Cohesive in what sense? They're on the same topic, so all things that involve mathematics should be in the same component. Maybe not. All right, so the first of the four is friendship. If you have two things that have to be friends, like a thing and its iterator, they, they have to be in the same component, full stop. That's the most important reason. The next one is mostly an excuse. If you don't know how to avoid cyclic dependencies, then you're gonna to have to figure out how to put all the things that are cyclically dependent in the same component or module. Because we're not gonna allow cyclic dependencies across module boundaries ever over my dead body, ever. Because it's not necessary. So if you feel it's necessary, put them in the same module. The third one is single solution. And before we had C++11 and variadic templates, we had to create artificially a bunch of things that had no same dependencies. So here's an example of something that has uh, uh, say variadic templates, they have you know no arguments, one argument, two arguments, they're all very similar. They don't depend on each other, but they solve a single problem. And so in that case, it's okay to put them all in the same component because when C++11 comes along, we'll replace it with something that is also one component, but implemented more appropriately as a variadic template. It's the same thing. There's no reason to separate them. There's no motivation. Now, on the other hand, we might have, for example, a coordinate, a point, a box, a box collection, and a garage. And you could argue, well, who in their right mind 
would be able to use a box collection without a box. So you say, of course, I'm going to put the box in the same component, the definition, as the box collection. What's wrong with that thinking? It's unidirectional. So in English, that means <laughs> you can reuse the box. So we can use box all over creation and never care about a box collection. We can reuse coordinate all over creation and never care about a point. So when you have something like this, instead of arguing it in this uh, very poor way of saying, well, I, anybody who needs this is going to need this. Think the other way. Anybody who needs this isn't necessarily going to need this. And so this is a bad idea, and we're going to break it up, and we're going to create separate components, and I don't care how small they are, but we're going to have different hierarchically reusable pieces so you pay for, at link time, for only what you use. And also in disk space and complexity and testing and... Yada, yada, yada. All right. This is fine. Now, the last one is an engineering term, which we're, I'm sure we've all heard, flea on an elephant. It's an engineering term. What it means is, if you have an elephant and you want to add a little bit more, say, for example, you have a logger and you want to add a scoped guard, that's not going to be a problem because the scoped guard is part of your usage model. It's part of your user doc. You want to be able to describe it. You don't want to say, Postulate a flea. No, just put it there, that's fine. Uh, another form of a flea is operator double equals on a value semantic type that doesn't need private access. That's still a flea. There are a lot of fleas out there, and that's okay because we're engineers first. On the other hand, if you have a flea and you implement an elephant in the same component, there's a problem because anybody who needs a flea is not going to put up with an elephant. So those have to be in separate components. Now, it isn't a continuum, right? It, it, it's, this is bad. And there's a temptation to say, well, you know, what about intermediate things like, uh, I don't know, how about a dog and a cat or a goat and a pig? Or, no, 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 no. It's got to be one is tiny and doesn't add any physical dependencies, doesn't add any mass to what you're doing, doesn't add any complexity to speak of. In that case, we'll forgive you because we don't want to be extreme, but we want to be pretty extreme. If it isn't pretty much an elephant and a flea, it's got to go in separate components because there's a dependency. All right, the next topic is encapsulation versus insulation. So we've talked about, yes, sir. Um, back to your box and the product. Box and box. Yeah. This one? What if the container is the only way that you could use the things that are being contained? Can you think of an example of that? Oh, sure. In my work, I have. In your work. Can you articulate it to the masses so I can repeat it? Well, I mean, off the top of my head, I... I'll tell you what. Come back. I'm going to... At the, at the, seriously, tell me at the end. Think about it. The thing is, we would like to build things that are hierarchically reusable, and the goal would be not to build something that's useful only in this context. But if you were to do that, it would be private to the component. It would not be public. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So if it's something that's not stable, I have two things that cooperate, like a list and its link. The link would be private to the component. It's not intended to be flexible. And even though the link probably is stable, if the interface between the container and the containee is likely to change, you want to keep that private until it's stable. Yes, sir. Okay, so what, you just, what I just heard is you can't have a single one. They have to be viewed in the container. In that case, to make sure of that, the constructor would have to be private and uh, uh, the container would have to be a friend and make sure that that didn't happen. Right. And in that case, they'd be together because of friendship. Very good. All right. Glad we cleared that up. <sighs> I'm not going to sleep tonight because of this declaration thing, you know. <laughs> it's really bothering me. All right. Insulation. So, logical encapsulation versus physical insulation. This is important because modules are going to give us one but not the other. An implementation detail of a component type, data, or function that can be altered, added, or removed without forcing clients to rework their code is said to be encapsulated. Does that ring true for everybody? Does that make sense? If I have an encapsulated implementation detail and I decide I'm going to use something else, 
my clients shouldn't have to rework their code. They should recompile and they'd be done, right? Anybody not like that definition? It's good? Okay. <clears throat> Next one. An implementation detail of a component, type, data, or function that can be altered, added, or removed without forcing clients to recompile is said to be insulated. So what does that mean? Why is that important? Why do we care about that? A lot of people think it has to do with compile time. It used to have to do with compile time, but there's something that's much more important. So let me tell you a true story. I was working at Bear Stearns about 20 years ago. Just about 20 years ago. And I had implemented a node-based container. I think it was a hash table. And I had a pool underneath for the nodes. Life was good. And back then, I was not quite what I am today. And I created a pool that was of size 100, because that's a good number. And anytime anybody needed a node, uh, I would allocate 100 of them. And there you go. And every time, you know, put that in, we put it on the free list, you know, build up the free list and the whole thing. And then one fine day, somebody at two levels up, because we had the infrastructure group, the middleware group, and the application level, somebody decided that they would create at the application level a vector of a million hash tables, each having zero, one, or two things in it. Okay, so it blew up the runtime because I had 100 things for anything that I had, 100, start right off, oh boy. So that was bad. Um, and so I had to fix this. Now, because I believed in insulation, the, 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 the pooling thing, whatever it was, when I went to reallocate for the pool, I could change that without making my clients recompile. So all I had to do was change that from 100 to 32, which is why I don't like those constants built right into the header file, but don't get me started. So 100 to 32 and boom, I had fixed the problem. I gave someone a dot O, they put it on their link line and I was still had a job. Later I realized I could change that pool from 32 to an adaptive pool that went from zero to one to two to four to eight to 16 and saturated at 32. And that was the best answer I had for a long time until Pablo Halpern at this very place about four years ago said, what is wrong with you? Just hold two pointers to the thing and never sew it on in a, in a, in a link, a free list or anything. Never do that. You're ruining your cash. You're ruining everything. Oh my goodness, what is wrong with you? And I said, you're right, you're right. So now we changed it again and now there is no saturation point and now we don't kill the cache and all of that. And the new implementation runs slightly faster than the old one. Not a whole lot, but faster, but it's so much more elegant that I can't even tell you. So that is what we have now in BDE. The, the moral of the story is, had I embedded, had I said, this thing is 100, I want to make sure it's initialized, so I'm going to make it a, a, a constant in the header file, I would have been looking for another job. So I mean, seriously, because it was a big deal. So is there so much flexibility if you just choose the small parts of your application that you might need to change on a dime and don't compile time couple them in because what would have happened is I would have had to get the middleware group to re-release and that would have taken at least a month and I would have been toast. You, you do understand it's not compile time. It's all of my intermediate clients would have to rebuild and redeploy and that's not something that you can do but if you have an insulated empty tail you can drop a patch on the link line of the most the highest level client and you're done. Does that make sense? So that's why it was good. So insulation is important. All right, so having said that, here we have a bunch of components. Now, if you look at Scott Meyer's very first book, Effective C++, he had dependencies going up, and he never did again, because I complained. Um, but, but seriously, uh, this, is, this, is how, this is how not to do dependencies. But for some reason, I wrote this slide and I like it this way, so this one time just turn your head upside down. It also gives me the opportunity to say never do this again. So this is the client on the bottom, but really the client's on the top always for many reasons. And uh, there's a library component and it's got an empty detail D. So D is an empty detail of a library component. Here I have a client using the library component and now I make a change to the header file of this empty detail. And what happens? It causes a change that goes right through to the implementation of the client, right? Because this has to recompile, clearly, and so does that because it goes through the header file. So we don't want that to happen. So that 
is encapsulated, but it's not insulated. Now, maybe it's okay because it doesn't change. Maybe you don't care. Maybe it's something that's so stable, we don't want to be worried about any performance costs that might be associated with insulating it, and that's fine. But we start to talk about memory management. Memory management is something that needs a lot of tuning, as you might imagine. And so that's something that's subject to change. So we say it's not D that's encapsulated, but it's the use of D that's encapsulated because this empty detail over here, let me go back to this. This empty detail here is visible to everybody. It's not a private component, it's public. People who need that because it's stable can use it. So one of the other things that we, we try to encourage is when you write a component or a module, try to make it stable, try to make it do something that's reasonable unto itself. Don't try to make it tied to something else where that something else changes, you have to change because that's not stable. When you have stable independent entities, they can be reused without changing them, that is a great thing. And that's, that begets hierarchical reuse and that means that you build on your software capital and you amass all of this really great stuff and you want to strive for that because that ultimately is the huge return on your investment. So private things don't pay you back the way public things do. All right. So having said that, we have this other thing here. Now, e.h is used in the implementation file of C. So when that changes, we cause a change there. That has to recompile, but that's it. So E is insulated by C, but of course, no, it's not insulated by C. The use of E is insulated by C because it's how it's used. Does that make sense? So we have encapsulation and insulation and they have these properties. When would we ever include a header in a header? What is the reason for doing that? Does anybody know? When you need the type, well, but if you, well, when you need the type where? In the header file? If you have a member. Can we, so we're going to make a list of reasons why we might need, what's the overarching reason why we would include a header in a header? Well, why wouldn't we include it in the .cpp? Why would we include it in the header? Why would we include a header in a header? So that the header compiles. That's the answer. So, a header must be self-sufficient with respect to compilation. If it's not, you have a broken piece of code. The same should be true for a module. All of these properties that I'm talking to you about, just replace component with module, we're good. Has to do that. That's why I know this. There are five reasons that I know of for why I would want to include a header in a header. And it might be a slowly growing list, but basically here they are. Is a if something includes something else, excuse me, if something is a something else, then you know you're going to need to know what the base class is in order to do anything with the drive class. That's not even an option. So that's a reason for a header to include a header. Now the interesting question is what about modules? Should that be true of modules? Do you automatically import to the, or export to the client the base class if the derived class is exported? I had this discussion in the past like 48 hours with people like uh, Andrew Sutton and others. We've come to the conclusion that no. You wouldn't be able in a module to, re to name the base class just because you exported the derived class. But any self-respecting person who's exporting a derived class is gonna also export the base class as a matter of course, and so it's fine. But anyway, the point being is we don't want to tightly couple the physical properties of a component or module with the logical properties of C++. We want them to be somewhat independent. And then we want good common sense to take hold and say, of course you're going to export the base class. What's wrong with you? Unless there's a reason not to, which I don't know. But I don't have a good proof for saying there's no reason not to, so we'll leave it to the library developer to decide. So is is a good reason. What's another good reason? How about if I have something as a data member? I have a type in it, you know, I have my polygon and it has a list. A, a, a list of points. Is that a good reason? Should I include the list of points in my polygon header? Has it? Yes, because otherwise it's not going to compile. I need to know the definition. What's another one? Somebody say it. Well, if you can't forward it, then yes. What, what's, what's another one? So if you use it in the interface, is that what you're saying? If you use it substantially in the interface, no. Turns out that's not a good reason because you might not need it. 
And if you don't need it, there's no reason to have it. So take, for example, this point, a, a pen vertex, right? And I named it, the, the point is the type and a pen vertex. And I, you know, I would not do this necessarily, but I might. But I certainly don't need to include point here in order to do that because that's just a reference. I can forward declare it, right? I can do that. I could. And so for the purposes of this exercise, I would. Yes? Okay, so you have a problem with this. You're in good company. When Scott Myers saw this in my book in 1996, he called me up and said, have I been oblivious for all these years? Does that really work? And I didn't know what to say because he's a you know, pretty knowledgeable guy, but it turns out a lot of people don't know that this is the same deal. You don't need to know the size of point in the client unless you use it. But you do need in the CPP file, unless it's an abstract interface, in which case you don't. It's a pure virtual function, yes? Right, but here's a really important point. This is super important and something that modules give us. If the client doesn't import it, the client is not allowed to use it. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't work here because if you include something in the header file, the client can create an independent version of it, and that's bad. That's called a transitive include. If you rely on something else's implementation in order to, to, to include what you need, and that implementation changes, and that's no longer needed, and the include comes out, your code breaks because you didn't include what you need, and modules will fix that. You see what I'm saying? This include here could go away. I don't want modules to give people the right to make instances of empty details of my classes. Yes? How about point is its own class? It's not typed to anything. Point is class point, for sure. For real, no, seriously. That's important. I don't, I'm not a big fan of type diffs. I like things to be what they are. Yes? What about the user assigned to the domain line? Okay, well, we, we haven't, we're, we're going to get there. Good point. Wait, wait, let's go ahead. And so, say my objection is like, it can be class point as a still object because the user can call n vertex and get a compiler error because the compiler doesn't know how to deploy the result. Okay, what you're saying is that the user forgot to pound include point. But, but a pen vertex returns point. By your, by you, they don't know it? Okay, so here's the thing. One, another way to do this is to say that if there's anything in your world that might be needed, make sure to include it. That's the other end. We don't do that. We include the minimum, not the maximum. And there's a reason for that. It's physically sound. If you include everything, you just, it's just a big ball of mud. You don't want to do that. So I'm, I promise you it's better to include the minimum, not the maximum, because I'm not interested in that kind of convenience. I'm much more interested in stability, and I want the user to know what they're using. And if they're getting a point back, they damn well better know what the properties of the point are so they can do something with it. So I want them to include it and read it. It's a big deal. It's not a little deal. It's huge. Include what you use. Don't rely on somebody else to include it for you. It's not a good idea for physical reasons, for emotional reasons, you know. It's, it's important for stability. Yes? Would this work also if you didn't pass by reference in your argument? Yes. If this were just point, it would work. It's not because it's a pure virtual function. It's because the header file is just a declaration. It's only when you use it that you need to know its size. If you don't believe this, go home and try it. It's true. This I know. All right. In the implementation of this, it's using it fully by size. But in the header, it's using it only. So if you're using Polygon and for whatever reason don't need to use anything that requires a point, you don't need to include point and therefore whatever. Now when point is used in the interface, eh, it's not such a big deal. When point's used in the implementation only, 
then modules will save you because if you try to create a point on the outside and you didn't export point, you can't. Whereas with header files, you can. And that's a bug. And that's one of the biggest bugs we have is called transitive includes and people relying on empty details to build their own thing, making it forever necessary for us to support empty details that we want to change out for other things. Does that make sense? So that's important. That's something modules will fix. Okay, another one. Inline. So if I have the function body uses the thing, then, it, then for this to work, when the, when the client brings this in, I'm going to need it. And depending on what style of template uh, you use, you know, templates that we see, they're going to have to be, we're going to have to know the size on them possibly. It depends again on whether the compiler does any kind of sanity checks on your templates. Enum. Well, until we had enum classes that could be forward declared, um, you couldn't do anything with this, so yet you had to do this. Now, it turns out that the enum classes have the same properties as ints these days. Uh, if you, you can't really forward declare them, and they also have the option of alighting the enumerations, and therein is something that I would call an attractive nuisance, because if you have a component that gives you the full enum definition, there's nothing to declare, and if you try to declare it, you're going to have to declare it with its underlying integral type. And that's the same thing as declaring a, a, a global variable like int i. And, and then if the int changed to a long or a long long or whatever in the definition and you forward declared it to be extern int i, there's no neighborhood to catch you. And the same thing goes for the enum. But what makes it worse is there's no header file to include either. So you're basically toast unless when you write your enum class you provide a forwarding header as well. And so this is the first case where I see you either have to provide two components to describe an enum class or one of the C++ 11 enums uh, or you have to provide a second header file that's used specifically so that you get that neighborhood property. And it's annoying because it may cause me to have to change what the definition of a component is in C++ because of that one thing and it's so annoying. Or not, I'll just say screw it, it doesn't matter. But it's something to think about because more and more the idea of forward declaring things is not as good as the ability to just have it include so that you can refactor things more automatically. And the last one is this type def thing, type def to a template specialization, and that's what string is. And so you don't want to forward declare a string class. You want to pound include something like string forward. And that's what we would do. And really, not everything has to be forward declared. Just include the thing. But if it's something big and used often, you might want to have a pair of components that do this, or you might decide you'll have two header files, two, two things to import. So. And there are some other things like covariant return types and whatever that are on the fringe and we don't need to worry about. You get the idea. The important thing is if you need it in order to compile the header file, then do it. Are there any questions? This is the part, this is sort of like the background and then the next step, we'll talk about modules specifically, what the requirements are. Any questions? Okay, here's some questions. I have questions. Why don't we read over these and see if you've answered most of them. Now keep in mind these questions are, most of them were covered. Some of them require kind of like uh, an exercise for the audience. Do you think if somebody came up to you afterwards in the courtyard and said, hey, I asked you one of these questions, you'd be able to answer it? All of them, hopefully, most of them? Because that's the idea, you should be able to answer these. How about this one, just for fun? How do we do this? Hmm? That's correct. So what we said is we walk the include graph. It turns out that if you do everything just so and you don't have any local declarations of, uh, of uh, um, dual or external bindage functions, if you do that, then you're guaranteed that your include graph or your import graph from your .h and your .cpp will provide an envelope of physical dependencies that are possible. And you can do that orders of magnitude faster than Clang can ever do what it needs to do. So it's really nice 
super good approximation that's worked for 20 years to extract the physical dependency graph from a collection of properly designed .h.cpp pairs that satisfy all four properties, also known as modules. Okay. Does everybody know why we would put an include in a .h? What's the short answer? To make sure it compiles. To make sure it compiles. And then we have some special cases. Good. What's the cost benefit associated with insulation? The cost is indirection. So the idea is if you try to hide stuff from the compiler, clearly the compiler is, is, is not in as good a position to optimize. So the less that you show the compiler, the more at risk you are of having a performance penalty. And that can be anything from a little bit to you have to allocate things and you use the pimple algorithm and things get really gnarly. So if you are going to insulate, the, the, the trick is insulate early and then uninsulate based on performance need. Don't do it the other way around because that's kind of silly. Get the compile time flexibility while you're in your early stages and then remove it because it's easy to remove. That could be done. Insulation also can be done on a component by component basis. Whereas levelization, which is the idea of avoiding cycles, is a, a completely you know, architecture-wide thing, and it's very hard to fix. So at least insulation is something that can be done incrementally and undone incrementally. All right, so now the next part. Um, so I wrote this paper back in quickly. Again, the stuff that I do, I guess the good stuff is done just quickly. Because if you think about it too much, it's, it's bad. So this is good stuff. And the paper that I wrote was about what I think are the business requirements for modules. And basically what they are is about how we take modules, whatever that turns out to be, and start to use them in large code bases. So I decided rather than try to write more slides, I just put the paper up and highlight the interesting parts and talk about them. And so it's a critically needed language feature and originally, the idea was to speed up builds. But anything that we do that puts sort of a, a wrapper around this notion of a component that gives the compiler some structure is going to help us speed things up. And so the hard part is getting it right so that it does the other interesting parts, which are more architectural and engineering oriented. And the deployment part is something that we can work on afterwards, because whatever we come up with, whatever logical design we have for components, the physical part will be optimized. So um, some of the ideas were uh, clean up vestiges of the language. This is you know, the idea that we're going to fork the language. We're going to say, all right, well, once we start using modules, we, we, we're, we're going to stop using all the old code. All the old code goes away, and we'll just start using modules. And if you think about how much sense that makes, uh, not really so good. Um, we can't do that. That's not, that's not a reasonable thing to do, because there's just way too much code out there and people doing their jobs. And if you try to tell them that, we'll just run this script, and it'll change all your code and all your client's code at the same time. It doesn't make any sense to people in my company. Like, they wouldn't know what to make of that comment, nor did I when I heard it. Um, so we have to do something different. So the purpose of this paper is just to create discussion. And since this paper was created, a lot of discussion has happened, and I hope to be part of it. Um, so a lot of work has gone into tooling. Uh, and there's, there's some idea that, that um, if, we, if we work on tools to do this, that it's, it's going to somehow be better. For example, if we just create repositories uh, and, and we have pre-compiled things and it's already already there, then life will be great. But that's not really part of the C++ language. That's more of a deployment strategy. And with the deployment strategy, there's good and there's bad. Um, if you imagine that we have to have compiled lower level things before we can compile the next level of things and so on and so forth, we've introduced a complexity into, into the build process that's rather staggering. And so while that is certainly an option, it can't be the only option. And so in theory, it should be possible to build an entire program from modules 
from source and to be able to do each translation unit in parallel. That should be an option. Another option should be to have these module pre-compiled units for the lower levels of the system that don't change much because that just makes sense. But the idea that it would be built into the language and that you would have to have a repository seems wrong-minded because we tried that before and we know it doesn't work. We know that we had template repositories and they don't play well with uh, um, source code control systems. They don't, they, they, the whole thing is, uh, is just fraught with, with, with agony. And, and I lived through it. I can tell you that, that it was replaced by a different uh, compilation system where instead of having template repositories, believe it or not, the template definitions were put into each .o redundantly, and that's better, believe it or not, than having just one. And you say, what? Who would do that? Well, it turns out that's better, and we tried the other one and it didn't work. And that, that's just a fact of history. And if we don't listen to history, we're condemned to repeat it, and I don't want to repeat it. At least I don't want to be forced to repeat it. So I don't want to build that into the definition. So, premature optimization is the root of all evil. I want to focus on what our needs are, what are the requirements, and then once we've done that, we'll optimize it, and that will naturally happen. So, right from the beginning, integration has to have certain properties. And I named the properties as being additive, hierarchical, incremental, and interoperable. So there are four things that I came up with off the top of my head that just have to be. Now, what do I mean by additive? I have a code base at Bloomberg. It's huge. I can't change it. I, I can't change any of it. None of it. But I want to start using modules. I don't have the authority to change any of it. I want to start using modules. What do I do? I write some code. None of the other code changed. Now I have a module. And I can use it. I can write an app and use that module and use all my other code and life is good. And others can do that also. So that's a good thing. So I can add modules to my system. And I don't hurt anybody. That's imperative. That's not optional. That must be. As soon as you say, oh, just, just do this. No. Okay. Purely additive. The second one is hierarchical. And this sort of goes without saying when it's purely additive, except it doesn't because of global variables. Imagine I added a module and it changed the meaning somehow magically of the code underneath me through global variables because they have somehow an extern something or other and I go woof and all of a sudden that code means something else. No, that doesn't happen either. So the code underneath is truly not affected by my adding modules and there's no upward dependency. So the third one is incremental. We don't have to do anything globally. Anybody in any group can start to work with modules in any staggered time frame, and that's fine. And then the fourth one, interoperable. And what that means is, if one group starts to use modules and they're trafficking in my BSLT date class that I wrote 15 years ago, and it's in a header, great. I'm, somebody's consuming it through the interface of this module. Somebody else has gone off and written their own system and they can't be bothered with modules and they're using dates. Now finally, somebody at a higher level, at the application level says, oh, I like that subsystem and I like this subsystem and I like dates and I'm gonna use them directly, I'm gonna use them over here, I'm gonna use them over here and they're coming from all different places. It's imperative that that date be the same C++ type that there is absolutely no issue of one definition rule violation, period, full stop. That has to happen. So if those four things are met, then we can talk about modules. But if any of those things are not met, then modules are a problem. Now I've already said something that modules will give us. Modules will allow us to use a point in the implementation of Polygon and not export it. So if I have, for whatever reason, I have a polygon, and internally I decide that the data representation is going to be, uh, not a polygon, let's say it's a uh, rectangle, and I've got the lower left and the upper right, and they're implemented as points, but in the interface they're represented as independent coordinates. So let's just say ints for now. Um, in header files, people could use that point, create their own point, and do whatever they want. 
But in modules, if I don't export the point, the client compiler can take all the advantage of what a point is, inline it, do whatever, and yet no one can create a point. So if I later change my mind and say, I don't like point, I like something else, I'm not responsible to support that forever. So that's a good thing about modules, and we really, really want that, and I'm sure we'll get that. That's easy. Now, other people would probably want something like, if I change point, if I change from point and go to something else, my clients don't have to recompile, right? That would be nice, right? That's not going to happen. So anybody was hoping for that, forget about it. That's not going to happen. There's still going to be the compile time coupling just like there always was, no matter what you do, because that's not being proposed or changed at all. What's being proposed is encapsulation, not insulation. If you want insulation, we know how to do that. There are idioms for it, pimple and other things. Okay? Just so you're clear. So if anybody was hoping for that, it's not going to happen. We good? Okay. <clears throat> so, the goal is that, that, that a module would deliver a more powerful unit of encapsulation than a .h.cpp bear. And um, the notion of logical and physical encapsulation, right? Logical encapsulation is the client, the, the uh, clients can't see into the the body of the uh, of the function, but the but the include allows other people uh, to use whatever types you've created, and with modules that would be affected. So this there's also this notion, so the, this notion that the compiler has, the, the client's compiler has more ability to see what you have than the client, him or herself does, the the, the author. So the, the compiler has special powers unless you export it. That's an important property. Uh, this will solve the transitive include problem. I just wanna, that's a really huge thing. Um, now, another thing that's going to come up, and it's going to be a big deal, is contracts. You can build a library where it's optimized for speed, in which case you don't want to have all of the runtime checks that might be useful. You might want to build a library in debug in which case you would like to have almost all the checks that you would want unless they would affect the big O speed, they would violate the contract of whatever you're doing. So you take all the checks you can, that's debug mode. It's maybe half the speed, but that's okay because you're not running optimized, you're running debug, it's all good. And then there's the third one which is audit. If you're running an audit, that means that you don't care that it, we're going to do checks that are linear time even though we're doing a logarithmic operation. We're going to check everything. We're going to go nuts. And so if I build something in audit mode, I want everybody who's using me in the program when they call one of my functions for it to be in audit mode. Now, with header files, that's not possible. But with modules, the idea is if you have a module built in audit mode, even if it defines templates, even if it defines inline functions, if it's built, if it's destined to be audit mode, then every single thing that's defined in that component will obey the one definition rule and will be in audit mode for anybody who uses it. Do you see why that's not possible with header files? Because the source is compiled by the client. And when the client compiler is in optimized mode and the assertions are turned off for inline and template functions, what do you do? If you have different translation units uh, and some of them have templates that were built with audit mode and some were built with optimized mode, in practice it works, but you don't know what you get. But in theory, it's a one, defin one definition rule violation. What we're talking about with modules is that there is no one definition rule violation at all. Whatever the module was set to be, everybody gets the same thing. It's either in audit mode, or it's in uh, debug mode, or it's in uh, optimized mode. This is important. This is something that modules give you that header files don't, so it's a big deal. This is my dream. Yes? So just like the real world, when you have a library that's built in debug mode, it's not the same library as the one that was built in optimized mode. What we're saying is 
the language has to provide a capability whereby we say, use this, everybody gets the same definition of this. And how that before works... Before with headers, I had a choice. Was it or not build it? Mm -hmm. And therefore, as long as I didn't... When you say you had a choice to build it or not build it... That means, for example, I, I, I have like a vector library that has these debug. I could build the lower level rendering uh, component and use the audit mode version of this too. But my gameplay code, I didn't bother to rebuild. It's not using audit. Oh. Okay, so what was said is you could have a mixed assertion level build. Yeah. You can do that with header files. Yeah. What it means is by guess, by guess and by gosh as to what happens. Because with inline functions and templates, whether the linker does it or the compiler does it, or which translation unit gets what, is kind of like a crapshoot. Sure, I understand okay. there's a crapshoot going on. Now, we do that, and it works fine. Exactly. But it's a one definition rule violation right off the bat. Now, vendors can take care of that for you. What I'm saying is, we want modules to be able to have the power, somehow, that we can say, this module, this module is in audit mode for this program, full stop. We want that capability. Now, one thing that's important, a module should be as good as a component in every respect and better in some, otherwise it's no good. So what you're saying is you have a business need for a module to relax that. Talk to your compiler vendor and get them to have a relax switch that says, no, let the, let the client decide, and then it's on the vendor to make sure it's not an ODR violation. Does that make sense? Possibly. I'm not quite sure what the, the requirements are for that. The, well, the, the, the point being, if you have no side effects in your assertion expressions, yes. it's all going to work. Yes. Shh. Don't tell anybody, they'll get all upset. It's ODR violation, oh no. Can't have macros, no, no. All right. Um, let me just put, the, I, I didn't talk about this one. So, um, I would like modules to have more power than we've discussed. I'd like them to be views on existing systems. So now they're acting not just as better components, but they fundamentally allow you to filter capabilities. So. If, if I have a system and I say, I want to give this to Alan because Alan's really good and I'm going to give him the whole system and here's the wrapper and everything and he's using it and he's just really happy. And then I say, you know what? I have a different wrapper and this wrapper doesn't give somebody else, we won't point at anybody, quite as many uh, underlying types and some of the methods like pop on a stack are a little too dangerous. We're just going to omit them on, on a class-by-class -class basis, so we could have either a whitelist or a blacklist. The reason for this is when people are in a corporation, sometimes they want to provide a stable view of software, and the new features are all throughout the system, but they were not ready to release them, but we're running, we want them to happen, so we just don't give them to certain groups yet. We try them on a couple of groups, and when we finally make sure they're working, we give them to other people. C++ doesn't have this capability, and the way you try to work around it now is very painful. You can try to wrap it, and that is a lot of redundant boilerplate code, and you cause type problems. Whereas here we're saying, let's say Alan has a stack that has a pop, and 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 it's all good, and somebody else has a stack that doesn't have a pop, and somebody up there imports both views of stack, they get the union of the capabilities. So he has a pop, somebody else doesn't have a pop, when you put them together, you got a pop. If, if he had a pop, but no push, and somebody else had a push, but no pop, and you put them together, you got both. The idea being that, that now we can mix and match views on a system. We try to do that sometimes, and it's miserable. So here, this is not a must-have, this is a want-to-have later. Let's not preclude the possibility. That's what I'm saying. And this is called a facade, you know, we do this. We actually write something that is a view on a system where I have all these moving parts and then I have a single view up here, one component that lets you do all the things the system does. And I'm saying, instead of having to deliberately export the types and worry about it, and you either get the whole thing or nothing, you can say exactly what sub-view of the system you want to expose. So again, it's a thought, it's not, a, it's not fully baked, we don't have anything like that now, so this is a, would ni be nice to be able to prototype, use, and then recommend. 
which is something that Bloomberg is going to do. But we haven't done it yet, but we're going to do that. Okay, um, now, again, if you've ever written procedural interfaces, you know, the purpose for a procedural interface is to provide typically insulation and sometimes translate from C++ to C. So you're going around with functions and you, you know, you create a, uh, a polygon, you get back a pointer, and then you add a vertex and you get back a pointer to a point or whatever it is, and it's all opaque pointers into things. And the nice thing about that is you can change anything under the covers and it doesn't matter because all of these things are insulated. All you have is functions. Now, if you do your procedural interface right, you can throw down a C++ header, and now that you had a pointer to a point, it's now a real C++ type, and you can operate on it directly. And we want to make sure that modules, no matter where things come from, no matter how they're alighted, have that same property, that even though they don't insulate you from things, um, that, that you, you, can, you can use the more, when, when, you, when you put them together or whatever, you, you're still always talking about the same underlying type. So that's really important. So here's an example. Suppose I have a system like this. <clears throat> I have a library, uh, a bot I have a, an existing um, header uh, library with a header, and I have some subsystem that's, that's using that library with a header that's also a header, and now I create another library, library one, that's module-based. And then you can imagine I create a, a system that's module-based that uses this library one module interface. And then you can imagine later that I create this other thing, C1 client, that's module-based, has to be module-based because things that don't have the capability to deal with modules can't understand modules, can consume this and consume that and can consume that, and any type that's common to them will not be an ODR violation. That is the use case that I'm talking about. Um, This is how we can keep our, our current code base and then evolve towards modules as we go. In other words, we're not, um, we're not, we're not doing anything in a big jump. We're going to evolve towards it. We'll always have our old code. There always will be stir length with the dot H. I mean, that's always going to be there, but we're going to get there. Um, it seems to me that the previous approach to Google, which, which, which had the cache, uh, is, is not something that's generally uh, applicable to everybody. I think Google has a special circumstance and I think what they do is great. They have a single source code repository. They have tools that run through everything and they can do some amazing things. But for other companies that aren't like that, that don't have a single repository or for example, open source code that other people use, not that Google doesn't, but the point is we have to get things and keep them that way. We don't have the luxury of just running a script and changing it. And so we need to do things incrementally and build on what we have much, much more like the standard does. Uh, and so I'm envious of Google, don't get me wrong. Yes, Chandler. You do not have, uh, you have something that goes from source, builds up a whole bunch of stuff and, and produces the outcome in one shot, right? No. All right. Well, you're going to have to give your talk on what you did again because I saw it and I thought I understood it. Um, but one of the recommendations. No. I, I mean, sure. I just, yeah, I, I, just, just can you say in one sentence what you'd like me to say, and then I'll, I'll move on because I have five. No, I, I, I don't know. I just don't want to give the impression that there's some centralized module. Cache. All right. Chandler says that there is no centralized module module cache, but I will say that that Google's uh, approach is is not necessarily typical of what we would want the rest of the world to be because Google is itself a special case. Can I, can I leave it at that or you don't agree? I just don't know what, what you mean by it. But. All right, let me, I have a minute and a half. Let me just try to get through this. Once we've addressed uh, all of the other things, we can talk about uh, compile times. In other words, once we get through these architectural requirements, these business requirements, then of course we want to do things with compile times and of course that will happen. Um, there are many good ideas. Uh, my intention was that this paper serve as a vehicle to talk about things, and I think that's happening, and Bloomberg is now very much involved in being an active player in trying to figure out what the right thing is for everybody, especially large corporations that have similar constraints to Bloomberg. We're going to cooperate as much as we can with the other players in the space because we want to get this done as quickly as possible, but no sooner. <laughs> All right, questions? I have all of 42 seconds left. Yes. When do we get modules? Okay, so when do we get modules? 
as soon as possible, but no sooner. There is some thought that we were going to take the common parts of what everybody agrees on and put them in the standard and then figure out whatever else we need and put it in the standard. We kind of did that with concepts, except the difference is the concepts had the agreed upon part and the puzzle piece that was the not agreed upon part in place for a very long time. And then we adopted the puzzle piece that was with knowing there was a puzzle piece that was not quite as popular. What we have now is we have a very fuzzy, brand new puzzle piece with no other puzzle piece. And I'm loath to think that there's any chance in the world that that's going to be something we're going to accept anytime soon until we have at least a plausible other puzzle piece to talk about. And am I done? Is that what 149 means? Okay, I think I'm technically out of time, so I'm going to stop here. If anybody has any more questions, please come up and ask. And thank you very much.